evening, everyone. Let's get started. Uh, we have a really rich agenda tonight, and I'd like us to try to keep on time for it. Um, welcome. It's the September edition of the Wards 1 and 8 NPA meeting. Um, I'd like to just start by recognizing the anniversary of 9-11 and uh, the loss of life that took place on that day and all the loss of life that took place after that as a consequence. So if we could just have a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, I got a call today from Jared Wood, and he asked me to suggest to the to the crowd uh, that 9/11 be used as a national become a national holiday, and I think that's a really uh, it's a really interesting idea. He said, "Well, of course things aren't going to change at a board, at a ward meeting, but you got to start somewhere. So we may have one or two national holidays that we celebrate that." Um, we don't need. Uh, he's, for him, Bennington Battle Day came to mind, Indigenous Peoples Day or Columbus Day came to mind, and, uh, and so it's something maybe we want to think about. Um, let's move on to, uh, why don't we all introduce ourselves and then we can do speak out. So if uh, everybody could just say who they are and where they're from. Um, speak into the microphones, please. We want to make sure that everybody can hear and it's recorded because this goes for posterity. Um, Carol. I'm Carol Livingston. I'm on the uh, Ward 1 and 8 uh, Steering Committee. Hello, everybody. My name is Adam Roof. I live on Pearl Street, and I am your Ward 8 City Councilor. Thank you. Hi, Keith. Hi, I'm Linda Risby. I'm on the steering committee. I live in Ward 8. I am Angie Chapel so Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street. I'm Lisa Lax. I live on Tebow Parkway. My name's Human. I live in uh, Ward 1 on Loomis. Sophie Quest, Old East End. Hi, Bob Butani from Fletcher Place. Susan Butani, Fletcher Place. Richard Hilliard, High Grove Court. Hannah King, UBM. Grace Basino, I live in Ward 8. Aiden May, UBM. Kaylee Haberstrow, UBM. Uh, Keith Pillsbury, University Terrace. I, I'm the Ward 8 School Commissioner. Mm. Um, I'm Sandy Barrett. I live on Luma Street. Jason Williams. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for the University of Vermont Medical Center. And I'm Susan Linsky, and I'm from East Avenue. I'm Jack Canson. I live on Pearl Street. I'm the East District City Councilor. Jean Hopkins, East Ave, co-housing. My name is Susan Ames. I live on Billadu Parkway. Pick your money van with Cito. Kelt Wilska, intern for Cito. Uh, Kaya Forley, I live on Jermaine Street. Jimmy Lease, I'm visiting from South Burlington. Dave Colley, Ward 1, Nash Place. Pat Seelan, resident, Nash Place. Rachel Fernari, Orchard Terrace. James Dufour, Orchard Terrace. Uh, Dan Daniel, Pearl Street. Charles Winkleman, uh, College in South Willard. Jason Stuffel, Colchester Ave, and Old East End Neighbors. 
Karen Fortner, uh, Centennial Court. Sandy Wynn, Mansfield Ave. Linda Sheehy, Mansfield Ave. Okay. All right, thanks. It, and I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I'm on the steering committee, and I live in Ward 1 on North Prospect Street. So why don't we have, start with Speak Out? And if there's anybody who has anything they want to talk about, we'll go back to the back row. I'll try and make this quick. Um, I'm here as a Ward 1 resident and representative of the hundreds of people who together comprise the Cancel the F-35 grassroots community group. Since the press is failing to perform its duty to fact check the mayor and challenge him on his questionable stances and approaches, the uh, task falls to us concerned taxpayers. On Monday, the mayor held a well-attended press conference to unveil the plan to make Burlington a quote net zero city by 2028. Meanwhile, at that same event, several of my fellow colleagues carrying a large protest banner and colorful protest signs occupied the public space immediately to the right of the mayor and his entourage. They were there to point out how the mayor is increasingly embracing his unassigned role as the greenwasher in chief. On one hand, pledging the city to meet uh, aggressive net zero energy goals, while on the other, act actively supporting the world's largest single source of carbon pollution, the US military, <coughs> via the uh, VTANG and the local basing of the F-35, and recently winning approval of a truly misguided plan to sell carbon offsets the value of the city's green canopy, aka our trees, to polluters in exchange for cold hard cash. The city is way behind on this goal, and thus the last thing he should be cheerleading is unnecessary and inappropriate jet fuel guzzling war machines and selling out carbon, selling our carbon offsets. If anything, the city should be doing everything it can, it can to reduce reliance on aviation slash air travel and buying, not selling, carbon, um, Uh, what happened here? Um, carbon offset since at the current rate, the goal of net zero is little more than a pipe dream. My colleagues stood in silence to represent the silence emanating from the mayor, his cronies, and sadly the press on these issues. Moreover, the mayor recently acquiesced to an off-camera interview, and in the resulting piece published on September 8th, he's quoted as saying that he only heard about the data showing the F-35's heavy reliance on afterburner use, quote, within the last 24 hours, unquote. That's pretty remarkable given that I was part of a group of concerned voters who specifically told the mayor about this phenomenon at his Beers in the Back event on August 29th. Fully 11 days prior to the release of the transcribed interview. Are we to believe that it took the reporter involved 11 days to transcribe this brief interview and upload it to his outlet's news site? Well, when we called the mayor out on, his, on this apparent fabrication, he failed to respond, quite telling if you ask us. Additionally, when several of us showed up last week to part two of the mayor's Burlington Housing Summit <clears throat> and repeatedly made the case about the overwhelming damage to the area's stock of affordable housing that will result once the F-35 arrives, at least 2,000 homes will immediately fall into the category of unsuitable for residential use. <clears throat> Our argument fell largely on deaf ears. It seems that the mayor and all of his affordable housing groupies are perfectly willing to sacrifice the 6,000 plus people who live in noise affected homes at the altar of US imperialism, the mil military industrial complex and government waste. After all, the mayor has made it very clear to us that he's not in favor of tearing down any more homes in response to the well-documented harm that will result from the local basing of the F-35. Instead, he wants to destroy people's quality of life and permanently impair thousands of children hearing and physiological and emotional development in the process by forcing these largely working class families to live under conditions that he himself wouldn't put up with for a second. The mayor and our region's complement of so-called affordable housing advocates tout the statistic that 1,400 some odd affordable homes have uh, resulted from the city's inclusionary, inclusionary zoning uh, ordinance, yet no one from this sector is willing to own the fact that the arrival of the F-35 will result in at least 2,000 affordable homes becoming immediately uninhabitable. 
The mayor's in favor of adding more insulation and replacing the windows in these homes, which were this to occur, would take at least five years to come to fruition, but seems unable to comprehend that A, um, noise mitigation work hasn't even been accomplished yet, and the aircraft start arriving any day now, and B, all the noise mitigation efforts in the world become worthless the minute an affected person opens a window or ventures outdoors. I can't help but wonder aloud how differently the issue would have been addressed were the neighborhoods affected populated by the wealthiest among us instead of mostly the disenfranchised and vulnerable. Environmental racism, racism anyone? The mayor, uh, a former Senator Patrick Leahy staffer, is far more interested in preserving that relationship than protecting the residents of his city. What more can I and my colleagues say other than to continue to point out these glaring inconsistencies and demand that the mayor end his ongoing support for the unjust and inappropriate local basing of the F-35? Thank you. <laughs> Who else would like to speak? It's all in the back row. Just a big shout out. I am just so excited to see so many people. I've been coming to this for a long time. Thank you all for coming. This is really exciting. And I want to congratulate all the people that are on the committee that have got this going. It's really cool. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, so hopefully everyone got a flyer uh, somewhere around here, but uh, a whole bunch of organizations in the neighborhood got together to throw a party on this Friday at Schmanska Park from 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, it's to get to meet your neighbors. Uh, we'll have people from Bayberry, Chase Street, Colchester Ave, all the side streets off of there, like Chase, uh, Mill Street, uh, Nash, Tabolt. Um, some of the sponsors on here are all listed, like Old East End Neighbor Coalition, UVM uh, Office of Student and Community Relations, Campus Kitchen, uh, not listed, Kathy's Flowers as well, um, Burlington Parks and Rec, Local Motion, they'll be there and are doing e-bike demos, uh, and AARP as well. Um, Campus Kitchen is sponsoring food and drink, uh, so bring some, like a blanket or chair to sit on, uh, come down and get to know your local park. The barn will actually be open uh, for viewing, which is um, it used to be open all the time, but currently it's not. So you get to see what a nice piece of our neighborhood is there that's currently not being used and what can we do to get that open. Uh, and additionally, uh, for Colchester Ave, if you're wondering what's going on with the bike lanes and everything like that, there is a Public Works Commission meeting next uh, Wednesday, September 18th. Uh, that's at the DPW building on Pine Street. Uh, so I encourage you to go down there and voice your opinion about uh, the current safety on Colchester Ave. I know a lot of people voice uh, concerns about that. Um, but please come on down to the party. It'll be a great uh, opportunity to get to know your neighbors. Uh, we did this last year for the first time, and uh, we got to meet a lot of new people, and it has uh, grown from there. Um, and a lot of neighbors have put a lot of effort into this. So thank you. Thanks. Keith, you have a microphone down there? Is this okay to use? That's perfect. Okay. I just want to make sure that um, everybody knows about the Burlington School Board's uh, uh, monthly update on the construction progress or the construction design right now of the Burlington High School and Burlington Technical Center. The, the update will be um, for the Building Oversight Committee. It will be next Tuesday. The um, whatever that is, the, uh, the 17th at 5.30 to 7 at Burlington High School Cafeteria. Thanks, Keith. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Kaylee Haberstrow, and I'm with the UVM Student Government Association. Um, we'll be here probably every month just giving some updates on what we're working on. Um, so this past weekend, we did a lot of work with the UVM Office of Student Community Relations, OSCAR. Um, they had their community coalition on Friday, and we thank Councillor Rue for being there and joining in on the conversations. Um, on Saturday, we helped give out welcome bags to off-campus students to welcome them into their new neighborhoods and homes. Um, and then just a few brief updates on what our big initiatives are on the student government for this year. Um, we have a Safe Ride Home program that is hoping to launch like mid-semester, definitely by next semester. Um, and it's going to give students safe, free taxi rides home um, any time of the day, any day of the week. 
Um, we have a campus food pantry in the works. We're just awaiting a space allocation for that. Um, and that will also be opening mid-semester or next semester. Um, our student government president, Jillian Scannell, sent the UVM president, um, Suresh Garamella, a climate report urging him to reaffirm his commitment to the current UVM climate action plan. Um, and in response to that, we're going to be hosting a climate strike on campus September 20th at 11 a.m. and we'll be marching down to City Hall to join in with the citywide strike. Thank you. Hi, I'm Seth Steinzer. I'm visiting from South Burlington, and thank you for your indulgence of letting me be here. I just wonder whether um, the uh, UVM representatives could report on uh, what measures UVM uh, intends to take so that the uh, problem that we had with the noise fest last spring uh, won't be repeated again this year. So you want to, you, you yeah. talked about this in, at a yeah. previous meeting, I know, but you want to just give them 10 seconds? <coughs> Uh, thanks for the question. I uh, didn't come prepared to talk about this, but we did have a meeting about that and the different things that we're going to be doing in terms of notifying uh, neighbors about um, the event that's going to be going on, uh, making sure that we're looking at noise levels and that they are appropriate, and uh, just communicating better with neighbors about that. So happy to talk more about that. Didn't really know you were going to ask, but you know my how to get in touch with me. Feel free to reach out again. Okay, we got, uh, we're actually like out of time, but um, if they're gonna be, at, we can talk about F-35s, we have to be brief, <laughs> if that's okay. Well, I don't think the issue should be censored, but um, I was at the uh, Net Zero press conference the other day, holding up a sign, and to me, the Net Zero is the same as gerrymandering. We're excluding the 1,100 gallons an hour that the F-35s are going to have. It's similar to me to what the Bush administration did with the budget. They refused to put the Iraq war in the budget. And if you don't put the F-35s in the net zero, then you're basically lying. It's not net zero when you add 18 planes at 1,100 gallons an hour. How many tanker trucks of carbon is that every day, every hour, every year? And that should be calculated in there, and then we should get to net zero. But to exclude that, and I heard the mayor say we're not counting the airport, we're not counting that, it's dishonest. And we here deserve better than dishonesty. It's just as dishonest as what the Bush administration did. So um, I just want to make that comment that it's not net zero when you add 18 planes like that. Thank you. Jimmy. Thank you, Jonathan. So I live in the city. In one of the two cities that is going to be most affected by the F-35, uh, Winooski and South Burlington. Uh, but there is a part of Ward 1 that is going to be affected most seriously. That's Chase, the Chase Street and Gorse, uh, Grove Street and Riverside Avenue near the Whit Bridge to Winooski. And, and uh, so the mayor and the mayor really is the obstacle here in the city government because the city council has voted uh, to oppose the basing to, and requested that the Air Force cancel the basing of the F-35 at the city's own airport. The city owns the airport and should be able to tell its tenant, hey, get something compatible with location in a city. And by the way, military law requires that you not base military equipment where it's going to harm civilians or where it's going to uh, invite U.S. enemies to target that base. This is totally illegal under military law. And the other thing that I think is very important is that the Air Force admits that there's going to be a disproportionate impact on low-income and minority people. This is totally unfair. The, a place like Summit Street, where the mayor lives, is immune from any of the noise, and people who are in affordable housing are going to be most affected. And speaking of affordable housing, the Air Force says 2,963 affordable homes are in the noise zone. And that is outrageous. Where are we going to get 2,963 homes? The mayor says, no, we're not going to 
the, the FAA says they, mu they want to demolish every one of those homes, move the people out. It's dangerous, it's wrong to have people living in that kind of a noise zone. That's, the air that's what the FAA does wherever this happens. But they're not gonna do it because it's too many homes. It would make, it would make everything, the whole economy, in bad shape because our, what we have a shortage of here is workers. We need a place for people to live. And when you put, when you make these homes undesirable, you're making it very difficult for the economy. And what's more, there's airport passengers. They're gonna be affected. There's 3,400 airport passengers a day using that airport who are gonna be in a tremendous noise zone, even worse than the people who live in the neighborhood. Who's gonna to wanna to use that airport? This is really bad for Burlington and for all the neighboring cities. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jimmy. Selena, and Selena will be, so fast. You'll, you'll be last. <laughs> yeah, I also oppose the F-35 basing, but I really just wanted to, I missed introductions, so I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Selena Colburn, and I'm a representative for the Chittenden 6-4 district. I saw my district mate, Brian Chena, just walk in, and um, just wanted to say this fall we're building up to the legislative session that starts in January, so please reach out to me, and I assume to Brian as well with your thoughts, your concerns, and what you'd like to see us move on in, in uh, 2020. Thanks, Lena. Okay, well, we're only a, a little bit off. The next item on the agenda has to do with the fact that the city council agreed to fund all the NPAs at a level of $2,500 for the coming year. And um, we want your ideas as to what to do with it. You'll find in front of you, unless you're toward the back, uh, an index card or two, and if you could just fill out what you think we should spend the money on. The ideas that have come up, and if, and if you're in the back row, then somebody in the second to last row hand one of the other cards back. There should be plenty to go around. Um, some ideas that have come up is uh, dinners. I mean, we could spend some money on, some of the money on, on dinners at NPA meetings. Um, special projects in the, back in the olden days, there was actually a, gr a grant style pr uh, process by which uh, people could apply for some of the money and use it. Um, more wireless microphones came up. These are, these are just ideas, just to whet your appetite as the kinds of things that you might want to wanna suggest. Um, but if you could just take a couple minutes and write down some notes uh, and uh, let us know what you think maybe we want to spend the money on. And th this, is the, this is the beginning of a discussion. So next month we'll come back, we'll talk more about it. 25, I'm sorry, 2,500 per ward. Uh, the, pr the prior amount was 400 per ward, right? So it's a substantial increase from last year. And we, and we have been using the $400 for food. That's the way we started. Uh, not all of it, but the snacks you see. Like most, most people's hands are down. Um, pass those uh, to an end and we'll collect them in, later on. Um, next on the agenda is Jason Williams from the UVM Medical Center and a discussion on mitigating helicopter impacts on residents. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Before I begin, I just want to uh, 
note that I'm joined by my colleague uh, Tara Pacey, who's a director here at the hospital who uh, oversees and has responsibility for uh, critical care transport. And so if there are questions that I can't answer, hopefully she can answer them. And if there are questions she can't answer, we'll have to get back to you. Um, so thank you. Thank you to Cindy for inviting uh, us here this evening to talk about this issue. Um, I have a couple of handouts that I think will be helpful uh, to orient the conversation. The first one is an updated map so folks know what it is that we're talking about here. This is a map that we uh, developed about a year ago and have amended um, as recently as this summer to expand the area that we uh, request that uh, flight operators uh, not fly over. And so the area that's, uh, that's marked in red uh, is the neighborhood area. It's important to note um, that there are several different kinds of helicopters that come to access the helipad, which is at the jug handle by the, um, uh, by the rugby field. Their primary, that, that helipad is primarily used for uh, uh, transporting critically ill patients to the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, these are uh, patients that are transported from other facilities or they're transported from uh, scenes of accidents uh, where people could be injured. Uh, I'm passing out a, a couple of pages stapled together. This is actually at the suggestion, the good suggestion of, um, I can't remember whether it was Rich or um, Susan, uh, to actually put images of the different medical related helicopter services that, that come to that helipad. Um, so people could more easily identify which is which. Um, largely, an, uh, until about a year ago, the, the primary uh, service providers were two out of northern New York. Um, North Country Life Flight or Life Flight of New York, those are the two. Dartmouth, as many of you probably know, has had a long time uh, service. And then about a year ago, the University of Vermont Health Network launched a service in conjunction with Dartmouth. Um, the other type of helicopters that use that helipad are military helicopters. Um, I can't answer questions about what they're doing there. Tara might be, Tara can't either. Um, so they, they, are, they land there. Commercial flights don't land there. Um, other types of helicopter traffic that you may see in and around Burlington don't, don't land there. We have um, increased our uh, outreach to the flight operators. Uh, to raise their awareness of the impacts of flying over the neighborhoods around the helipad, um, understanding that it is an impact on the folks who live around there, um, and uh, an impact that we would very much like to see uh, not happen. Uh, I want to note that we have the only service that we have a contractual relationship with is the service operated by the University of Vermont Health Network in conjunction with Dartmouth. We do not have a contract um, with any of the other services. They operate like an ambulance would and drop off um, patients who are then transported to the emergency department. Um, we have several folks um, have uh, been reaching out regularly with concerns about helicopter noise. Uh, this summer we instituted a new uh, system for reporting back to those folks. If anybody would, be, uh, would like to be added to that, I'm happy to, to take your email this evening, uh, and I just wanted to share the information from uh, August. So in August, we had a total of 55 flights that used the helipad. We had five reports uh, of, from folks who uh, reported helicopters flying over the, the neighborhood. Um, one of those was not a, a medical helicopter. We were not able to trace what the result was or, or why there was a, a helicopter flying over the neighborhood. Uh, and we communicated uh, in the other four instances with the operators. Um, and in those four instances, they were either the uh, North Country Life Flight or Life Flight of New York. I'm sorry, those names are so similar, it's hard for me to remember which is which. So that is the, what we're here to talk about re uh, regarding the helicopter noise impacts. Tara and I are happy to take questions um, from the audience. And I do have, um, Jonathan, I do have one quick additional update after this one. Okay. About another project. Is there a microphone in the back or? Um the wired one there, just so we're not moving back and forth so much. Here, Jack. 
so I used to work on a trauma helicopter and I totally support their mission. But what bothers me is knowing that they land over by that football field or rugby field or whatever it is, and then they have to get another ambulance to take them to the hospital, which from a medical point of view doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why the helipad is not by the hospital emergency room so that people can be wheeled in there. There's a huge enough parking lot, there's enough green space there to expose a patient, especially in January or February, to that ki a trauma patient, I'll say, to that kind of cold twice and then move them there. I just don't think that's good medical practice. So I don't know why we don't talk to the University of Vermont about putting the helipad right by the hospital or on the roof, if the roof can, if the roof can, you know, there's an engineering, if it can sustain it. Uh, where I used to work, we used to land on the roof of the hospital, go right into the elevator with the patient, take them right down to the operating room. But I, I think it's such an inefficient, you know, convoluted system that could be heavily improved. And, I, and, and for all those who are annoyed by the flights, sometimes minutes count in somebody's life and you need to take that into consideration. This is not an F-35, this is actually a life-saving mission. But I, I just wonder about the location of the helipad, especially when I saw it operating in January, February, I was like, what are these people doing? So I would really recommend trying to limit the heat exposure to severe trauma patients. Yeah, no, and I can say that is on our master facility plan to explore and look at, so. <laughs> it's worth noting that Dartmouth, at Dartmouth Hitchcock, the helicopter lands immediately so that next to the emergency room. And I just want to know why, why they were so smart and the administration at this hospital doesn't have the same Concern. Yes. So it's interest. I'm I'm interested in knowing. I did not know this before that you don't have any contractual agreements with anyone except the one that's your own. Correct. Do they have to have certificates of need? to operate their helicopters? No, all of these helicopters are operated by entities outside the state of Vermont. And there are absolutely no arrangements, memorandums of understanding, or any other kinds of regulatory or, I mean, there's nothing between the hospital and these helicopters, absolutely nothing in writing? A, a lot of the law governing medical helicopters is preempted by the feds, um, and that's one of the reasons why um, uh, I don't believe there is actually uh, a requirement that, that any state have a CON for a medical helicopter. Um, the one, one of the ones based out of New York is operated by a police jurisdiction, mm -hmm. um, but the others are operated either by hospitals or other companies. Uh, otherwise, there, the FAA, I'm sorry. Is yeah. there any kind of documentation about the way that they notify you that they're coming, or do they just appear literally out of the blue? <laughs> is there no kind of written agreement whatsoever that allows them to decide they're going to bring someone to you? So the operations of um, within ambulance and helicopter transport? Yeah, yeah. yeah. you got to really speak into it. Sorry. Um, with helicopter and um, ground transport, there are um, what we call a matrix of who responds. So there actually is um, practices about who responds first, second, third, um, backup, and protocols on whether you can go by ground or air. So those are the protocols that we use. Um, who owns those matrixes? Uh, well, in the local districts, like the 911 services, they're um, by district boards. So each of the 13 ambulance districts in the state have a district board that um, reviews their um, response matrix um, and their mass casualty plans. Um, so you have some kind of protocol air. that tells them where they land. They can't just go land in your parking lot, correct? Correct. And can't that same protocol tell them how they get to where they land? I'm not sure I understand that question. 
the route to the landing zone? Oh, I'm not sure of that answer. Well, that would be a really good thing to look at because that's the issue. The issue is there needs to be some kind of written agreement with whoever is bringing someone to your facility that they will comply with what your facility requires in order for them to evacuate to your facility. It is just unfathomable to me that there would not be some form of written agreement, documentation, memorandum of understanding, protocol, whatever you want to call it, that establishes in order for you to bring people to us, here's what you must do. So that's the first thing I'd like to say. I would love to know every protocol, memorandum of understanding, written agreement, regulation, everything they're under that allows them to come to you. And we just need to add something that says, to get to us, you have to come this way. Now, the second thing is, because I'm, I mean, this happens that there is such an increase in the amount of this, and I'm sure you're aware of this. There's such an increase in the amount of these flights coming over and you know, they're coming over at, in the middle of the night, right over where we're all sleeping, and they're very low where we are on Billadu. They're very low by that time. I'd also like to say that this zoning, uh, the red zone, and I'm, you know, from the F-35s, I'm going to look on a lot of these zones. It's funny, Billadu used to be in the sound thing, but the new sound thing took Billadu out. Imagine. Um, Anyway, the line is right on East Avenue. If I were flying the helicopter, I'd follow East Avenue. That's what they're doing. They're following East Avenue because it's like spotlights. It's got, you know, a trail of orange lights and there's nothing on one side of it because that's where the hospital is. So that I would very much ask that the um, western line of this be extended farther over because they're just following East Avenue. It's Broadway. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Thank you. We, we don't have time for other questions, but Jason, if you have a quick thing you wanted to add. Yeah, w one final thing, and, and just because this is what we try to do when we come to these meetings is uh, sharing any other impacts that are happening on the campus. Um, some of you may have noticed that we're constructing a, a perimeter wall along um, Mary Fletcher Drive. It is a sound perimeter wall um, to help mitigate the impacts of sound on that road on Mary Fletcher Drive and also the loading docks. And I brought along just a construction update notice about that that I'm happy to share um, as well. So you, we'll you're that passing around. that around? Yep. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd like to address the sound barrier wall, yeah, wall just for just one second. I, we are we're running late and we have a big agenda. If, if, I'm sorry. We, if you have a, if you, it, it, is it real quick? It is really quick. Go. The sound barrier wall was, um, was part of the... Um, yeah, use the Act, microphone. The sound barrier wall was part of the Act 250 permit from the Renaissance project and was supposed to have been built back in 2003 to 2005. So we're running a little bit late on the sound barrier wall right now. Um, but I'm glad I want to be uh, express my thanks to the medical center for eventually building this wall, which uh, was requested by a large number of, uh, of residents. So thank you for that. And there are some outstanding requests that uh, Susan Ames and other neighbors have asked about uh, year-to-date flights, year-to-date complaints, a breakdown by the, um, the companies that uh, we still haven't received. And those were requested back in July. Um, we would also like to get a sense of what is happening on the replies when you, when you uh, approach the carriers about uh, not following the flight path, what is actually, what are you conveying? What are they conveying back to you? We have no sense of, of what that is right now. I can quickly answer those two questions. In July, we agreed to uh, prospectively going forward report on monthly activity, and that's what we will do. So every month you'll receive an email from me about um, complaints that come in and, and how they've been handled. Um, and this month we included the total number of, of flights. Uh, when we call the operators, we're sharing with them the map. Oftentimes we're hearing it's a new pilot. 
Uh, and so they are re-educating or educating new pilots that, that come onto the service. So that is what we're hearing when we're contacting the operators. Okay. So I think then getting to Jeannie's point about having this part of the, whatever MOU that you have with these carriers would make a great deal of sense. And we look forward to that being carried out. If, if you could update us on that, that would be really great. We, we, we can certainly put this back on an agenda in a couple months, right? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, Mayor Weinberger is here. Um, he's got two things to talk about. The first is the status of City Place. And um, if, if I can give you 10 minutes on that, then it could be time for questions and answers, because we're on a little late. Great. Hi, Jonathan. This is kind of a new setup since the last time I was here. Does it work for me to stand here and, and, and talk? Great. Um, thanks for having me back. Good to be back here. It's been been a few months. Um, I was uh, hoping we could squeeze in a little uh, time for people to just w ask whatever ever they want, as well as t talk about City Place and the housing summit work that we've been doing since the spring. I'd love to squeeze in, if possible, somehow too. Uh, the fact that we just launched what I think. Um, is one of the most significant new initiatives the city has launched in a long time, this net zero energy city effort on Monday. And, and it's something that uh, for us to succeed at that particularly relies on the public understanding it and investing in it. So if we have time to squeeze that in somehow too, we'll try to do that as well. But we would, we would so welcome you coming back next month okay. to talk about it. All right. Great. We'll see where this goes. All right. City Place Burlington. Um, let me... Let me start by going back. I was asked to give an update. I was thinking about how do you give an update on something that has uh, been going. I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning on this, but I will go back to the fall of 17, which I think kind of brings us today and kind of quickly run through events, talk about where I believe it to be, share my sense of the implications for the city, um, and uh, then, yeah, happy to answer whatever questions you have about it. So in the fall of 2017 is when, after years of work and planning, the city council approved, I can't remember, the 10 to 2 vote, something like that, the development agreement that um, uh, uh, codified our relationship to this project and the expectations of, of the developer. Um, and uh, that, you know, at the time, essentially when we completed that agreement, that was the second version of it, the city had done two of the three big things really the city was responsible for doing. One, we went through this extensive uh, planning process and did change the zoning for the kind of core part of the town. We all know it impacted the height limits there. It did a lot of other things too. It put, it had higher environmental requirements, it had higher stormwater requirements, it um, had design review standards. Uh, the other big thing the city had done at that point is make a commitment that when the project essentially was done um, and met our standards and that the tax base was in place to support the city taking on new debt, we would pay for the substantial amount of new public infrastructure that is supposed to be created by this project. What happens from that point is then the, the developer is supposed to perform. And at first, things went fine. The developer moved forward promptly after that, took down um, what I certainly believe was a problematic building for our downtown, removed most of the mall, um, and that took what took place, there was a little environmental delay, they claimed, but it took until the summer, August of 2018, at which point it really became clear that they had completed that and they were stalled. We will never know everything that went on in between the private parties there that caused them to stop at that point. Clearly Don Sinex wanted to move forward. Clearly his managing partners did not. And uh, they had gotten, had concerned about the economics of the project in, in some respect at that point. From that point then until the midsummer, we went through this extended period where Brookfield essentially um, which is now the, the managing partner. That there were some corporate changes all through this time as well. But Brookfield, this Toronto-based, very substantial North American developer and property owner, took control of the project, essentially evicted Don from his, his role as the developer, as the project lead, took control and went through a something, a kind of redesign of internal elements of the project, and then a um, went through a, a bidding process. And the bidding process took place through the spring and into the summer. And clearly, um, 
they encountered problems. They went through a value engineering process. They were semi-public about that. They were they certainly made it clear they're having price, uh, financial, you know, project economics issues. By mid July, they had made and they informed us, and we very shortly after that um, had sort of joint statements between Brookfield and then the city, um, uh, where they made clear that they had they had sort of played out that hand, and there was a major financial problem, and they were not going to be able to move forward with the project as originally conceived. Um, uh, I put out a lengthy statement at that point, which um, if you haven't read, still up there on the uh, mayor's web page. We put a lot of thought into that. I think people kind of trying to understand the city's perspective on that. That's one place to look. But I'm going to summarize much of that uh, here as well. The next month and a half, we um, were pushing Brookfield very hard to come forward to the public and share some of the, the preliminary thinking they were starting to share with us, put some new images out to the public, give the public a timeline um, about where this project was headed. And I will say it was extremely disappointing when after weeks of preparation for that meeting um, with the city council on August 28th, at which they had uh, up until hours before the, um, the appearance been indicating to us they were going to share quite a bit about their thinking uh, for, for whatever reason. And they have given their public explanation why they felt like they could say almost nothing. They said virtually nothing um, at, that, at that August 28th meeting. That, that is very disappointing. And if this persists uh, much longer, it's really going to change what has heretofore been a um, you know, productive and, and collaborative relationship between the city. They need to change this. They need to become better communicators. I'm frustrated that I have to be here, the one to, to give an update of a project that is really fundamentally at this point, they are the ones that need to be performing and need to be moving forward. The city's role at this point is very limited. So um, what can I say about what we, where we believe the project to be? I mean, clearly, it, it, you know, clearly they are focused on uh, a few things that I think uh, are in the interest of the people who, those of us who, you know, which I think is just about everybody that want to see something happen on that site and move forward. One, there's a year-end deadline for the tax increment financing commitment, the call it $20 million commitment that the city has to pay for public infrastructure when it is done. Um, if they do not get a substantial amount of work in and under contract by the end of the year, um, the, it, there's, that commitment goes away and we actually have to go back to the state legislature for there to be kind of a renewal of that. So that is a very significant deadline that we know they're focused on. We know they're also focused on uh, our hosts here uh, in this building. They do continue to actively, uh, obviously the UVMC has always been an important part of the economics of this project. Um, there's still an agreement in place between the, the project and UVMC and we believe Brookfield to be very interested in, in keeping that agreement in place and, and keeping the hospital as a downtown tenant. Um, they are clear Clearly rethinking what Don Sinek's thoughts had been about the existing properties. So the, if you kind of remember this, and this can, I think, People almost sometimes forget that there's, there's more to this project than the area that has been cleared. Brookfield also owns Macy's and controls what will happen, the former Macy's, and they also control that what remains of the, the mall, so the property that, fa that fronts on Church Street and the L.L. Bean property. Um, Don had been exploring substantial expansions of those properties as well. That is no longer, that is clearly no longer uh, our sense of what Brookfield is thinking. They um, seem to be much more focused focused on moving quickly to get those buildings to a more productive state. Um, and uh, and I, when they said publicly that they thought that there would likely be 2020 construction, my sense is probably what uh, the most likely way that would happen would be um, either in the Macy's building or the existing Church Street property, or perhaps they might find a way to make it kind of refine the agreement with us such that they could move forward and maybe some of the public infrastructure work could move forward. Um, all that we expect to be a matter of intense discussion between now and the end of the year. So what does this all mean? What, is, what does this mean for, for the city? How, how, how should we think about it? First, first, I have three, three kind of important points that I, I, I hope you hear me on, at least consider, and then kind of a meta point about the kind of significance of all this. One, um, this, you know, the, the city, City Council and Administration went into this agreement with our eyes open, knowing that development was uh, an uncertain um, endeavor, and knowing that there could be 
delays along the way. And we worked hard to protect the city if something like what has happened were to take place. And to a large degree, we are quite well protected right now. So for example, um, uh, we got a reliance letter from Brookfield before we allowed them to move forward and, and get the demolition permit and take down the building um, that said uh, they had to perform, they had to have continuous construction. The fact that they have not been able to live up to that performance uh, guarantee uh, commitment is uh, uh, an answer for why Brookfield is writing checks uh, to us quite frequently now to cover the modest cost that the city is incurring right now. We have uh, a real estate developer consultant, we have a lawyer working on this. Um, though the bills for those professionals uh, since the delay began get paid by Brookfield. Um, we are protected in the sense, and this I have seen this misrepresented out there, when, when Brookfield has taken over the public right-of-ways, taken over the parking spaces on Cherry Street and Bank Street, something that we custom, you know, do frequently for construction projects in this town, we have a protocol for how we do it, and the protocol has been followed here. They are paying the city hundreds of thousands of dollars for the use of those spaces. They are paying as if the, the, they, there was parking. We, we are actually not losing parking revenue. We're getting more parking revenue than we otherwise would have because they pay as if the parking is uh, leased, is occupied throughout throughout the, the business day. There, the, the biggest protection, and I know we're short on time, so I won't go through all of them, although I'm happy to answer more questions. The, the biggest protection comes down to the fact that the fundamental way that we structured this deal was very conscious of construction risk, of development risk, and we wanted it on the developer, not on the city. So unlike uh, other public agreements, you can look around the country, TIF agreements, where public infrastructure gets built early on and the city go goes out and takes on debt uh, to, uh, and then gets in trouble when the tax revenues are slower than anticipated. That uh, can't happen here because of the fundamental nature of the way we've structured this agreement. And that was an important thing to us from the start. So this point number one, city's protected. Second point. We are watching very closely how the downtown is doing and have throughout, you know, before and through uh, this, this, this transition period for that, you know, key part of the downtown. And I'm happy to report, I'm, I'm relieved to report, and I frankly didn't know, we, no one knew if it would go this well. We all, you know, what would, what would happen if we took down hundreds of thousands of square feet um, uh, of retail space in the center of, of the city? What would happen if the Macy's property uh, shut off their lights? Which was, quick curly, quick aside, that was, that did not happen because of this project. That was, you know, hundreds, dozens, scores of Macy's stores around the country have been, have closed. Um, this one was closing, whatever happened with the project. What, what would happen with our downtown? Well, I'm happy to report that by all the metrics that we have, the downtown remains very strong. We have good metrics too. We have, we can look to our sales tax revenue. We can look to our gross receipts revenue. Both of those are good indicators of the amount of economic activity and commerce taking place in uh, in the downtown, and I'll say uh, here we are in September of 2019, and we are at or near historic highs, and and have been throughout this transition period. We the city, the downtown has continued to perform very strong economically. Now we don't take that for granted. We. Our, we stress about that all the time. We have CETO out talking to all the downtown stakeholders, downtown property owners. We know it's not a uniform story for every business owner. We know some businesses are more impacted than others by this space being dark. Um, we are rolling out uh, uh, some new business supports that I'm happy to answer, ask, answer questions about that are being funded by Brookfield by per the agreement and then per this uh, new commitments they've made during this delay to make sure that we keep that downtown strong and do everything we can uh, as a city government to support the downtown merchants. Point number three um, is uh, just, I, I do, I, I hope it's self-evident, but maybe it's not that um, 
we're not happy with this with this delay. It wasn't part of the plan, and we are doing everything the city can to keep this delay period as short as possible. Um, we have a very strong team working on it. Again, at Brookfield's expense right now, this Jeffrey Glassberg, one of the best uh, development consultants in the state, someone who has worked for the city in a number of different capacities. We're fortunate to have him kind of running point on this. We have a great um, attorney uh, also, also on this. I get weekly briefings on it um, we are pushing uh, in every way we can to see this period uh, brought to you know brought to an end and it moved forward I will say I think all the pressure and all of the pushing that we can do I think pales in comparison to the pressure that they must be feeling of having taken this property out of productive use having spent tens of millions of dollars and have a project stalled that is a very costly thing for a project to go through and that they must be under enormous pressure to um, find a way forward last point on city place they'll take questions what what you know kind of taking it up from that kind of granular level how how do we think about this was there some you know I've heard this described as a catastrophe I've heard people say this is a disaster um, you know it may well be a disaster for Don Sinek's and and Brookfield again they by all accounts have spent tens of millions of dollars. The city has not. The city hasn't paid for any of that work out there and as I've hopefully impressed upon you, we are protected from, from financial risk in many ways. Um, I stand by the decision that we made with the council in the fall of 17 to um, allow the project to move forward. I, I as, as, as frustrating and as unpleasant and as disruptive as, as it is to have this extended period with a construction site down there, I think it is a good thing for the long-term future of the city that that building, which was a problematic building from the day it was built, is gone. We are, we are insured to get those streets back that we fought for. There, that is now guaranteed. It is on our official city map. Nothing can be built on those public right-of-ways, even though we don't own them yet. We haven't paid the check for them yet. Nothing can be built on them. Had the project, had, you know, there's an alternate kind of universe where we could have said, well, you know what, we're not comfortable with you taking down the building. Get all your I's dotted and your T's crossed. Get all your ducks in a row before we allow anything to happen. That, that would not have been an unreasonable thing for us to do. Had we done that and then the project had encountered the kind of financial difficulties that it has, I think a very likely outcome at that point would have been uh, that they would have given up on the project, that they would have released this mall property and that we would have been stuck with it for many years to come, maybe decades to come. That can't happen now. We are gonna get back the vibrant mixed use neighborhood that I think the great majority of Burlington's believe in, even if you didn't love every aspect of, of the former plan. I think another kind of silver lining here is you might make, like the new plan that comes back in the coming months better than the original one. Um, that's where we are. Thank you. Um, Richard. <coughs> so one thing for, from the no update update, uh, to the City Council uh, that came out from what Brookfield said was that they have, and you confirmed it just now, um, that they have been speaking to the medical center. Uh, so why are they speaking to the medical center and not to the public? I don't understand that at all. And I, I'd follow up the same point that I made at City Council, that is if the medical center has got a $40 million budget gap, which they're telling the employees that they do have, why would they ever pay above market rents uh, for space in the building whenever it's built? I'll just leave that. Jason, Either. To Happy to have the mayor go first. <laughs> um, so like, I'm not going to uh, uh, condone their their failures to communicate with the public. I, I am stunned that a $300 billion company or whatever they are uh, has been as successful as they are uh, with as many, many challenges and struggles uh, as they have shown to communicate with the public. They've got to change that. They should be saying a lot more to the public. Um, why are they talking to the medical center? Well, I mean, they have a multi-million dollar agreement in place with the medical center, and I think it's good that they're talking to the medical center. Um, there are you know, I, I, I'm not sure that's an, a fair, fair, fair equivalency there. But um, uh, to the medical center's point, I mean, listen, I, 
I, I feel, I, I will say, I, I think as Burlingtonians, we should be a little offended by some of the reporting that has been made about this quote unquote above market rate. I mean, the, that is, that, first of all, there's, I think that is, from everything I've seen, not a fair characterization. The rate is comparable to numerous other downtown leases. Second of all, um, you know, I fought hard, and I'm not apologetic about the fact that I pushed the hospital very hard to consider um, keeping a downtown Burlington presence. They've had one for a very long time. It's an important part of the downtown economy to have uh, well-paid hospital workers working in the downtown, buying from our restaurants, buying from our merchants. And you know what? I, I, I it totally, everybody else pays a little bit of premium to be in the downtown uh, versus being out in the suburbs or the exurbs or in office parks. and People are willing to pay that downtown, that, that premium, because downtown Burlington is worth it. Because downtown Burlington is awesome and is good for business. And it's, uh, I, I, I think the, the notion that there was something inappropriate about this lease is outrageous. Hi, I'm Susan Linsky, and how are you doing? Good. Um, Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, yeah, what, several points. Um, the people who opposed this project predicted exactly what's happening. That's point number one. Um, we're left with a big hole. Um, and it is difficult for people who live and walk in this city, not necessarily the business people, to get across the town right now, for, for the big hole. And um, I'd like us to um, work on the perhaps we could go back on our planning and zoning decisions for the height of that whole block to lower the height, because I feel like one of the things about Burlington is that it's a beautiful city. And I, and I continue to be frustrated with the height, and I think the fact that that planning decision got changed so quickly, we need to bring that back. We need to back down. Now that we have the opportunity, you're right, this is a silver lining. We can back up and we can say, we're not gonna have those big tall buildings. We're gonna be protective of the view as you come in to this city. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is I'm hoping that we can get out of that TIF arrangement because that didn't feel very good for our children. So how I understand it was that's a tax for future future people, future citizens. That's how I understand it. It's not true? Well, no, it's anyway. not really true. I'm happy to explain it. And um, I guess the people, it's about the economics versus people and it's also about, when you say it's not a catastrophe, I call it a catastrophe of trust. I feel like it was really shoved, really pushed. There was so much money spent on getting us to, to vote for this and very hard to read um, ballot stuff when we voted. It was so, and, and then here we are. And it's a real catastrophe of trust. So thank you. I don't know what the question is. <laughs> um, Let me back up. Well, um, so yeah, there's a lot in, so let, I, I do want to make sure, t the TIF, let me take, a minute to, to explain TIF because it comes up again and again and talks about the city and I think it's, and it, it's, it is confusing and hard to understand and it's important that the public understand because when you understand it I think you realize it is a really great opportunity um, for, for Burlington, these TIF districts. We would not have the waterfront that we have today if we had not started a TIF district back in uh, the, the 19, early 1990s. We would not, um, uh, so, and, and you know, what, what the, there are very few in this state um, funding sources from the state or federal government at this point where we get any assistance in building public infrastructure. Uh, and that is what TIF is. TIF allows us to say if there is new public infrastructure that we can build that will increase economic investment in Burlington and lead to a growth in the tax base, you can and, 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 and you can, um, if building that public infrastructure now plays a, a real role, a critical role in the growth of that tax base, it allows us to take out debt, build that public infrastructure, and have it paid for by the future tax base that will only exist if the project goes forward. That's, that's the essence of, of TIF. So it is, it is really that, and in this case, we are particularly pers uh, uh, circumscribed about how we set up all the economics so that it was only the future tax revenues really 
virtually for all intents and purposes only the future revenues from this project that would pay for this public infrastructure. So it is not, unless your kids were going to be leasing uh, or in, um, in an apartment in that project, they there I guess in some sense would be paying their normal tax, paying their, for, through their new rent, their normal taxes, uh, but otherwise it was not a new burden being introduced on everyone else. Can we go back, you know, I do think, um, I, 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 I'm not, I, I don't know where the conversation is going to go with Brookfield from here. Clearly, if they want to continue to work with the city, there are going to need to be amendments to the development agreement. I do think it's an opportunity. Uh, there, there will be some revisiting of those agreements. Where that conversation will go, it's, uh, I can't sit here tonight and tell you. Hi, um, Karen Long, <coughs> Street. Um, I did go to the Ward 6 meeting um, because it was Brookfield's second visit there. And I felt the audience was really actually a little more abrupt and, you know, almost a little rough on the Chelsea and, I don't know, Mr. Olson. On and But on and, yeah, and rightly so. But, I mean, the guy was honest and he said, you know, he kind of, he couldn't answer. We have no plan. They had no budget, no plan, no timeline. People asked, are you going back to square one? They can't. They said, he said, I'll tell you when we know. And he did kind of say, um, well, you can see I'm doing a little tap dance here. I mean, he was honest. I feel like you're saying this is not a catastrophe to have, you know, boarded up area. Talk to Single Pebble and ask them how they're doing. Mm -hmm. They have closed their lunches. Talk to Tina's Home Design. She has been on church, in downtown since 1961. And foot traffic this summer was really bad. So places that have been there way longer than you and me are having trouble because there are not as many people shopping downtown. You know, I don't know where you're getting your numbers and maybe if we could project how it would have been if there weren't all the stores that are gone. People did shop downtown at Pottery Barn. We met with Mr. Vickery, John Vickery, the tax person. He said it was not a failing mall. The numbers were pretty good. So. I mean, I know you have to sell it to us that it's not such a bad thing, but it is a bad thing. It's a bad thing for me when I have to shop at the University Mall now for my granddaughters because we have lost a lot of stores downtown. So I don't know. I guess my question is the biggest thing that I saw was that when the mall was torn down, I thought it was going to start being built up, but there was no financing. That to me, PC construction walked off the site. So how did that happen in such a protected thing that we got in? We all know that's what happened. PC construction left the site. Correct? Um, well, I, I, I mean, PC would have been there with bells on had Brookfield um, been willing to sign a contract and go forward, but they decided not to do that in July. So, I, I mean, uh, this is, yeah. I mean, I think that part has been pretty well documented and they have been pretty candid and transparent about it. They went through an extensive redesign process. They went through an extensive bidding process. They clearly were unhappy with the economics at the end of that and decided not to go forward. And yes, the, at that point, the contractors pulled their equipment off the site because it's clear there, there isn't going to be building anytime soon. Um, uh, so yeah, that, in, in terms of that question. So may I, yeah. may I make a suggestion? Yeah. Um, oh, you know what? There was one thing I didn't address that Susan said that I meant to, and I think it's an important point. Um, can I come back to your suggestion? The, uh, the, the impact of the construction barriers on the right of way, on um, walking in the downtown, if there's not going to be activity on the site, that needs to be fixed. And one of the, only, you know, one of the things Brookfield did say is that they are, are working to restore the, the public right away and, and that needs to happen quickly and if there's not going to be construction activity that requires them to take that space, they need to move on that. So, uh, you know, look for more uh, definitive detail on that very soon. So I, I just might suggest you, yeah. you say the downtown's healthy, Karen is saying that she's heard of issues. There's plenty of data out there. I know the city loves data. It would be very easy to do a little longitudinal study on what's going on in the city. Sure. And throw it up on the stats page or throw it up on yeah. your page or something like that. I think it would, it would answer a lot of questions. It would clarify things for the public. Yeah. 
Fair point. I think some of that stuff is up there, but we should highlight it yeah, more. Yeah, or, yeah. or just put yeah, a link yeah. to wherever yeah. we can find it. Great. Uh, yes. You, uh, you need a mic. Uh, okay. um, Jason successfully deferred to Morell about the uh, hospital. I said he could go first. I don't know. <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so I am not involved in the communications that are happening with Brookfield, but I do know that some have um, occurred and continue to, to happen. Um, I can't answer why they aren't talking more broadly to other people. Um, we are talking about, um, we continue to talk about the specifics of the agreement we have with them. I will tell you, uh, we are concerned about the delays. Um, we have people in offices who we need to move uh, and have needed to move for a while. Uh, but I will also say that we are a ways away from an actionable agreement. And so the terms of which are not yet established. So we, we may have time for one more question, if there is one. Carol. I, I don't see anybody else. I'm just, yeah. OK. I'd appreciate it if you could tell us how closely tied is the success of City Place and the medical center's occupancy of the penthouse premium uh, suite. So if the, if the medical center decides we, we can't do this, the time frame is not working for us and we need to go look elsewhere or we need to pull out. Does that mean that the uh, the city place becomes the disaster that you said it was not, or just if you could answer that? Right. Um, clearly, the the medical center lease played a key role in the kind of Don Sinex vision, if you will, everything in one big building. Um, it's certainly our sense that Brookfield is looking at a pretty different development strategy, where um, uh, there or. Um, might be uh, multiple buildings and what was before one big building at which point um, I think kind of it becomes uh, less essential to you know, something getting built on the site. Um, it, it still, I, I think it does not change the fact that having um, hospital workers stay in downtown Burlington um, uh, is uh, it may not be essential for uh, something to move forward on that site. It would be a loss to downtown if there's not a way to keep them there. Okay, thank you. If we could move on to the housing summit conversation. Yeah, great. And maybe limit that one to 10 minutes also, and then we'll yeah. have a little question, a little more question and answer after that. Great. Um, let me set a five minute timer on my watch and try to keep myself. I get going on housing and I lose track of time. So, um, so let me say, in case I forget later, uh, whatever, there, there's a really good written document that um, the city team has developed that Olivia, who works in the mayor's office, has copies of here that has a lot of detail on the five uh, proposals that um, we're working through. And, and I'm probably not going to be able to get into a lot of detail about each of them. So if you want to get into uh, the nuts and bolts, you can, I encourage you to get that document or to go to the city's homepage where you can also see links to all this. Um, let me start by kind of sharing how I think about housing and what I think are housing challenges, which is, is something I've, you know, I've thought a lot about over my career and that really I, what I did before this job was for 15 years I was an affordable housing developer in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York. Um, and um, most, uh, almost the great majority of what we built was permanently affordable housing. Um, so housing where there's some government, uh, either regulation or, um, uh, or, or, or subsidy that helps ma make that housing get built and then stay affordable uh, by federal standards. And that kind of housing, the way I see Burlington's housing challenge, Burlington has done 
um, an exceptional job with that type of housing for at least going back to the, the Sanders administration for uh, a number of reasons that the having an extremely strong federal delegation that protects small states, having a uh, really forward-looking city government that was one of the first in the country to set up a housing trust fund and to set up, you know, Adecido initially and then it became its own organization, a land trust to um, uh, pioneer this idea of kind of shared uh, limited equity uh, housing, shared equity housing. Um, Burlington has really excelled in that in that area, um, and yet, um, at, while that has, I think, is fact. At the same time, we have seen um, uh, the, in some ways, the housing affordability challenge grow over the decades, and 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 impact. Um, uh, a much larger swath of the city than people that um, qualify or can be served by those government programs. And, you know, it got to the point, we did a study right at the beginning of my administration where the average Burlington tenant, um, uh, the study said, is paying 44% of their income um, in rent, which is an extremely high ratio. If you look out across the country, there aren't many places in the country where you have that kind of ratio. So we set out to try to do something about that. And we went through a long process of studying it and working with the city council. We ultimately had a unanimously passed housing action plan back in, I think it was 2015, that basically said, it had 23 points to it, 23 different actions, most of which uh, have gotten either done or, or are partially implemented now. Uh, the ones that aren't done are largely the ones that we're trying to finish now. Um, but those 23 action items kind of boiled down to two big strategies. One, it said, we are going to recommit ourselves to building as much permanently affordable housing and uh, and 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 the other element of that, and you know, upholding Burlington's sort of related, very proud legacy of protecting um, tenants and standing for strong tenant rights. We are going to do. We're going to do that as strongly as ever. Um, uh, and. At the same time, we are going to bring a new focus to building as much um, uh, housing for um, of other types for the for for all backgrounds and incomes, um, because we believe we what one of the drivers, maybe the key driver in this housing affordability challenge, is a supply problem. Um, there just haven't been enough homes built in in the area to keep up with rising demand. So. We kind of committed to that strategy back in 2015, and we've now been pursuing it for basically, you know, we sort of were pursuing it even before the, the plan was passed, and, and it's now been about five years since it was passed. And I think there's a lot of evidence that we're succeeding on both fronts. We have, we have built or protected uh, uh, more, retained more than 500 permanently affordable homes um, during that you know, over the last seven years, which compares well to prior periods of Burlington history, we have another 70 plus units coming li online this fall, the Champlain Housing Trust um, house uh, project on uh, Cambrian Rise. As that, that project, which is aimed at affordable family housing, is completed, uh, a new um, seniors, affordable seniors housing project, the developer being Cathedral Square is going to break ground and so by a year from now there will be another 140 plus new affordable homes uh, having been built and added to that total. This last seven years has been a time in which we have really gotten our act together in the code enforcement department and are doing, uh, I think, a much better job of kind of upholding the city's responsibility to ensure that uh, the housing that exists out there whether it's been kind of government f funded or, or just in the market, um, gets inspections and that um, landlords are held accountable for uh, fixing violations. And um, uh, it, we, you know, to give you one example of that, we have a, we had on the books a requirement that every, every apartment get inspected once every three years. The city never met that goal until Bill Ward came and was given this leadership position and uh, really reformed the way in which that office worked, got some additional resources, and we now have been in compliance with that for years. Um, and uh, we've gotten so good at that that we're actually now able to do other things with the code enforcement office, like respond within 48 hours on average to, uh, to complaints and to um, uh, start proactively 
actually um, doing spot checks um, in areas, responding to C-click fix concerns. So um, the other, on the, on the kind of market housing side, uh, we also see that over the last seven years, there has been a substantial increase in, in homes uh, being built. Um, one study that did, that did, that focused on the kind of downtown area showed that in a, uh, in the seven years prior to this administration coming in, there had been a total of 67 apartments total built. Um, in the six years after that, there had been uh, more than 600. Um, and that is before uh, some of the major new homes come online at Cambrian Rise, and, uh, and that didn't count uh, the 194 St. Paul Street project that, that opened. So it, there, there has been a significant uptick uh, in the production of new homes. And we see not just that those additional Burlington households are now being served by this, these new homes, we see some impact, as we hoped, um, on the kind of broader market economics. So we have seen uh, the vacancy rate, which is a key indicator of uh, whether a market is functioning uh, basically double um, in that period of time. Still way too low, still way too much ability for um, property owners to increase rents, uh, but not as bad as, you know, a doubling, still significant. Um, we have even seen uh, something of a leveling out of rental inflation uh, in the numbers, and I know a lot of people have great skepticism of it, and I get it, um, but uh, in the numbers, it, we have gone from a place where housing inflation was rising considerably faster than the general inflation to one where actually general inflation is a little bit higher than, than housing inflation. I, I see those numbers as an indication we should keep, we kind of double down on these uh, strategies um, in both of those areas and keep going. And that is exactly what we're trying to do with these five proposals that we've been working on since the spring. Okay. Th three of these proposals are focused on sort of supply kind of issues. Two of them are focused on affordability issues, and I'm happy to take questions about them. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. And could a link for our minutes to the, uh, to the key indicators would be awesome also. Great. It's something we'd love yep. to put in. Great. Selena. Hey, Selena. Um, Excuse me, can you grab a mic, Selena? Oh, yeah. I'm kind of trapped back here. Um, There's plenty of room up here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just don't know if I can. Okay, great. So, my question um, goes back to the work that we did together on the Housing Action Plan in 2015. And one of the points that um, I and some other counselors really advocated to be included there, it's number three in the Housing Action Plan, and it's about the original Housing Action Plan. And it's about really trying to define, as we move forward with this work, setting some targets around different housing types in response to our sense of the demand. So like senior housing, student housing, truly low income housing, affordable housing, family housing. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the status of that work. I think the idea was to um, start to get a lot more thoughtful about how what we incentivized and prioritized the city really trying to incentivize and not just let the market kind of decide for us. And I, I'm not seeing that as part of this work. And I'm not I'm just not sure how it's moved forward. So yeah. Um, great, yeah, great question, Selena. Um, I know that y there was a, there was good discussion about that, and I would say in some areas there has been that work done. In the areas where uh, I think it's there's some clarity about how you would set those goals, like student housing, we set a very explicit goal, right? So we went out and we said we did some analytical work with UVM and Champlain College. We confirmed that there were the best that we could measure 3,400 students living off campus in Burlington, and we set this goal. And we actually revised it upward at one point of trying to build 1,700 new student beds uh, to, to, to take a bite out of like 50% of that. And we've made some progress against that goal. I think we're up uh, over 600 uh, of those uh, 1,700. It's a little bit stalled out, I will say, since um, Champlain College took a little bit different posture than they had and that they got less bullish about building new things after they're kind of said they're not doing more after 
94 St. Paul Street. Um, the UVM conversation, I'm hopeful we're about to start a new chapter of, and it is now the main issue between us. And you know, we've kind of worked through a bunch of financial issues you may have seen in the papers. We've worked through, uh, I think, a historic agreement that may be a little grand, but a landmark agreement where uh, UVM and Champlain are paying for um, infrastructure, part of our infrastructure investment for the first time, really. Uh, now that those financial issues have been resolved, it is the main issue of negotiation and discussion between us and UVM, and my sense is the new UVM president is pretty open to some, doing some big things here, and I'm hopeful we're going to, in the months ahead, be able to uh, announce some uh, new initiatives there that could lead to a significant significant additional number of student beds. The, um, uh, we really wanted that to be, we wanted there to be a sixth uh, focus um, uh, on this list and with the transition going on at UVM, we weren't able to get there. But I hope there's an update um, on that soon. Uh, the, you know, we do certainly have kind of goals with the, there, there, it, you know, we, there has been this sort of at a countywide level, this very, uh, you know, this building homes together effort has created a kind of goal for the market um, and a goal for permanently affordable housing with, within that and Burlington uh, you know, has pretty much kept up with sort of its share of, of those goals. Um, and there's frequent reporting out on how we're doing against those goals. And, you know, you may have seen the press release on that in this week. So, um, you know, I think we basically have done that. Um, I think it's really hard to, uh, to, go, to do more than that. Um, I've not seen a good example of it done uh, out there. So I think that work has sort of ended with those goal setting efforts. Okay, cool. My name is Human, again, um, from Ward 1. And I uh, wanted to make uh, three quick points. First off, thanks for being here. Thanks to you and your colleague for being here and uh, talking about these issues, uh, putting on the summit the past two. Uh, I think they're really great. Uh, my first point is for the code enforcement, um, I think Bill Ward has done incredible job, as you, as you said, uh, taking it to new levels of, of work. Um, and I believe that code enforcement can still use more officers. Now, I'm not attacking code enforcement. I'm, I'm in fact, supporting them and in their work and want to see more. Uh, I have heard stories from, uh, I'm a tenant myself, from uh, friends and, and neighbors that have still have issues with uh, negligent, uh, irresponsible landlords. So that's, that's number one. The other one is, second one, is uh, on, your, on your packet here uh, for the five topics, and I did attend the previous summit, on the five topics, there isn't a clear bullet point here for tenants' rights. So the closest two are maybe energy efficiency and maybe housing trust fund. But those still do not really address tenants' rights clearly. And that is an incredibly important part that if, city, if the city is talking about housing and is talking about making it more uh, being more responsible than tenants rights do need to be included not just uh, landlords so and that goes to my third point is uh, please create an educational tool a video for tenants and hopefully by tenants and housing unions and people who are aware of these issues and I say video uh, because a lot of people in Burlington uh, do not have the same reading levels um, and access to uh, um, ability, to, ability to read clearly. Uh, a video on educating them about their own rights. I haven't seen anything like that yet. And that would be great to have. And also in different languages as well because this community is very diverse and have many different backgrounds. Uh, including refugees, immigrants, new Americans, all of the above. Thank you. Great. 
Excellent. Thank you. I, I appreciate the, the, the points and, and the kind of implicit question in there. Um, and it's, it's quite similar to feedback that we got at the first housing summit back in June and in at the kind of part two of the summit that we had last week. And, um, and I think it's been really excellent feedback. I, 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 I think the feedback has been really helpful in the sense that I do think we went into this exercise kind of having this list that had been sort of sitting out there for some time that we wanted to get done and with some focus on that. And I think um, maybe a little bit, uh, I don't think we ever articulated this way, but kind of uh, kind of resting our, our laurels a little bit as a city um, that we did have this very strong uh, code enforcement arm, that we did have this really long legacy of being on the forefront of tenant protection efforts, and it, it was not where the focus was at the beginning of this effort. In response to feedback like yours tonight, uh, I announced last week, um, and I said it at the city council meeting this week as well, um, we have, uh, we, we have I have directed a new kind of supplemental initiative to this with a deadline by the end of October. I've tasked CETO with reviewing all of the, the Community and Economic Development Office, with reviewing all of the uh, ideas that were submitted in the first housing summit for strengthened uh, tenant protections, as well as to look beyond Burlington and look at what has been going on in places like New York State and Oregon, where there really have been these uh, kind of new movements with new energy and new ideas about um, tenant protection and to review to view those ideas as well and to make a report to me and the city council by the end of October um, are there areas uh, are there omissions are there gaps are there holes are there things that we could should be doing better as a city to hold hold uh, property owners accountable and I will say I think I know I'm pretty confident three or four things are going to come out of that. One of them that I think is sort of uh, my sense, I don't know everything there is to know about this yet, but I, my sense is it's sort of a uh, missed opportunity today is there are, some, there are some excellent resources to support tenants in the community. There are also some excellent education um, resources that exist out there. I know Sandy Barrett has been, uh, you know, has, has resources. CVOEO has an excellent tenant handbook. Um, uh, clearly, uh, I think there's an opportunity to um, somehow find a way to do more uh, education of renters in Burlington so that you know what your rights are, you know how to get help if you do experience an issue. We're exploring something like, do we make it at the le every lease signing? Do you require there to be a copy of the tenant handbook? Give it over. Um, and I love your uh, kind of video um, idea as well. So more coming from that. I'll say the reaction from the council when I raised this on Monday was a lot of nodding heads. T council's eager to dig into this as well. So, you know, thank you for, for the consistent uh, input here. And I think something's going to come out of it. Just really quick. <clears throat> Um, there are some people in the room who have been working on uh, tenants' rights for a while. Um, uh, student government is here, and I know they've talked about doing something about this uh, in the past, but also in this year. Um, Councillor you know, Roof, Councillor Paul, uh, Sharon Busher, and others have worked on this. Uh, our Student and Community Relations Office puts together um, a training. It's a two-hour training, but we're also working on shorter version in video that will be available to tenants, so any tenant. In different languages? Well, well, we can talk about that. We haven't done that so far. We haven't talked about it. But this will be something that would be available for people to know about the kinds of uh, resources that are out there. So more to come on that. Thanks, Joe. And just, just to move on, thank you, Mayor. I uh, appreciate your coming. I know there's Great. a ton more to talk about. <laughs> Great. We'd love to have you back and talk about some more. Awesome. I'd love to come back. I do just, again, want to say this information is here if you want it. And I do just want people to know the timeline for action on, on these items, which uh, is, is, is coming soon. The, there will be a council work session on this later in the month of September. And then um, we are trying to have these items uh, in front of the council for action in October. They, they will not be the end then, though. If the council wants to continue forward with this, there will be a, numerous additional public hearings and opportunity for public public input going forward from that. So if there's something you care about, uh, stay tuned. There's a lot of ways to get involved. Thank you. Yeah, Pat. Oh, yeah, use the mic, please. Oh, here you go. Hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> So on CETO in the fair housing, there are videos that are linked to CVOVO and also 
Vermont law help that has in different languages around housing discrimination, um, but we can try, we can make it more accessible um, for it to be in the front, and that's a great comment. If there's anything that can be improved, you know, the, you, you should definitely bring it to us. Thank you, Pat. Um, and I would just urge everybody to heed the mayor's suggestion that if you, if you have ideas, you want to be engaged, now's the time to be engaged in, the, in, the five, in these five areas before the decisions are made because the city doesn't need to, to rethink stuff that's already been thought again. Now's the time to make an impact. Now's the time to say what you need to say. Get your ideas involved, engaged. Um, so that we don't have to do another do-over on something. Thank you. That's my that's my two cents for the day. Um, Officer Murad, I'm probably going to Deputy Chief Officer Deputy Chief Murad um, is the next pers person on the agenda. And uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, we can set that up. Um, if you want to start talking, I can start setting it up. I can get that in there, and then when it's in, sure. you can Because it'll take me a second. Okay, it's sure. a, a little IQ test, and Adam knows how to do this, and he just left. And he just left. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is John Murad. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations for the Burlington Police Department. Um, and I was asked to come tonight uh, and, and very gratefully agreed to come to talk about traffic issues. So I have some slides there simply because some of the data that's involved is, is certainly better uh, up on a screen than, than me just talking about it. Um, and I tried to put together a document that would be a little bit about the traffic uh, for the city overall. Chief Del Pozo um, had put together a very comprehensive look at traffic over the past uh, several year period um, and looking uh, largely at both uh, the traffic uh, stops that we do, also uh, traffic results, that is whether we have crashes, whether we have crashes with injury, um, and then uh, I think it's going to be the thumb. Is there a thumb there? Yeah, try that one. There we go. Pay no attention. Um, and also uh, the disparities that exist in certain kinds of traffic enforcement. I'll grab on. I'll take that over now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If you just give me one second here. So I just want to say, in terms of the time, I, I knew that Adam was leaving, so I figured we could take his 10 minutes and use it up. But Jack, you're, you're still up. Thank you. Um, so with regard to traffic enforcement, There were several aspects of the analysis that Chief Del Pozo had created, and I've added a couple slides into this one that are specific to wards one and eight. Um, Overall, traffic stops are decreasing. So traffic enforcement is down. And it's down about 50% since 2015. Um, crashes with injury, however, are down as well. And this tells us a little something about enforcement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, traffic safety. And enforcement is not the only means of creating and obtaining traffic safety. Uh, crashes with injury are down about 41% since 2012 and about 17% since 2015. Um, other things that are, of course, important to the community and to uh, certainly to Chief Del Pozo and the department are whether or not we have disparity in our traffic stops. And uh, there has been a, a great decrease in disparity for traffic stops, particularly with, drag dri with black drivers. Um, Search outcomes are equitable across races. Search outcomes being a, a sense of uh, sometimes called hit rate or, or a gold standard for identifying racial bias in decisions to search. Um, warning rates are equal across both all races, all drivers, assuming people have a valid license. And it's about 80% of drivers get a warning if they are pulled over for a traffic infraction. Um, however, the challenge is that uh, approximately 13% of black motorists are driving without a license. 
and 5% of all other motorists are driving without a license. Once you factor that in, then the warning rate changes. So warning rate for those with valid licenses is even across the board, but people without licenses are not really el eligible for warnings during traffic stops. Um, so there are some things that we still want to address and reduce. We want to continue figuring out whether or not we have uh, certain disparities. It's complicated by our uh, inability to know precisely how many drivers there are and what the actual driver and pro the driving population is. We believe the census is not a strong proxy for driving population. When we use crash data instead, it creates a different percentage of drivers across races. Um, and crash data tends to be a fairer method of assessing who's driving, simply because we're all equally likely to be involved in crashes. Um, We are also worried about and, and always concerned about the qualitative experience of drivers when they are stopped and making certain that we are not only prioritizing safety, which is the mission of the police, but fairness as well. So here is the good news, that crashes with injury are down. Crashes overall are rising a bit. Um, they are slightly up. Uh, but crashes with injury are significantly down. And much of this does in fact have to do with traffic calming measures, with uh, engineering answers, and not necessarily with enforcement. Although specifically focused enforcement on particular locations when we hear about uh, ongoing problems uh, can in fact have temporary but important impacts. Um, this is data specific to these wards. And here we see largely the same as we saw in the city. Uh, to go back, there's the city. Um, it's a little steadier with regard to the de decline in, in uh, crashes with injury. But we see the same thing here. Um, and we see that there are, uh, that the trends are also down there. It's relatively flat for overall crashes and it is significantly down for crashes with injury. Overall traffic stops, however, are decreasing. Period. There are fewer traffic stops. Officers are doing fewer traffic stops. Um, and the, the number is, uh, is significantly down and we anticipate it being further down this year. This year, for, uh, rather for 2018, uh, the last year for which we have total data, there were 2,727 total stops and about 444 of those resulted in at least one ticket issued. And that's that 80% uh, range of, of warnings, that warnings are prioritized over, over tickets. Uh, Chief Del Pozo believes that traffic stops are one of the more fraught experiences that the police have with the public they serve. That it is a, a, an encounter in which we don't make our neighbors happy no matter what. And so there is an element there in saying we have to address the behavior that is in front of us. These stops were occasioned by something. They were occasioned by speeding. They were occasioned by violating lights or signs. Um, and yet uh, the need for enforcement beyond the stop itself is uh, arguable and as is for that matter the efficacy and the effect of those stops with enforcement. Here's traffic enforcement for these wards and as you see it too is down. It's down with uh, regard to the the city even even differently than the city. Um, to go back that's the city here are the wards. Uh, I will say that we have a fair amount of enforcement still um, in specifically in, in the corridor on Main Street. We are often on sharp detail in that location, sharp detail being an overtime uh, detail that's differently funded, and there is uh, often calls for attention to the Main Street corridor in the vicinity of the university, uh, the Main Street corridor in the vicinity of the jug handle, which is uh, the, the largest location of crashes in the city. Um, I know stop signs are something that has been expressed as a concern in this ward. Uh, I was in communication with Mr. Hilliard. Is he here tonight? Sir. Um, we do have, we, we are enforcing stop sign violations, but it's down and you can see that in this document. Uh, the map is a little bit difficult to read. If I'd had a little bit 
my analyst went out uh, with, she had a baby uh, last week, um, and uh, really, really happy for her. But uh, as far as being able to crunch this picture uh, of where the violations are occurring, the violations count, these, these bubbles uh, don't necessarily give us the best picture, but they're closer to a heat map than certainly, you know, drawing single dots would end up with just dots in locations because enforcement occurs in specific spots again and again and again, intersections, stop signs, etc. Speeding violations. Now you'll see there that the speeding is up uh, in the vicinity, specifically, as I said, uh, on the, the corridor uh, in the vicinity of the university um, on the jug handle there. And there are still, we have an officer named Kyle Ye who's doing really good work with enforcement, is still out there doing a lot of traffic enforcement. And it is my intention to, to increase that. I think that the, the number of of stops have actually gone low and perhaps too low and that we need additional enforcement. I hear it from NPAs. I hear it uh, in, in all of the NPAs in front of which I've spoken. There is a desire for increased traffic enforcement specifically around stop signs, speeding, et cetera. And um, I think we are going to be looking into that. It's just a matter of making certain that we're doing so in a way that is fully equitable. This goes back to what I was talking about with regard to parity in the warning rates for licensed drivers. Um, and you'll see that there was a, that there, there were differences and those differences have largely been closed. Chief Del Pozo has been very clear on, on this as a, as a point of importance for the department and his resolve is working. Overall searches with regard to traffic stop are down sharply since the legalization of marijuana. Marijuana gave a very easy and readily, uh, readily accessible example of either reasonable suspicion or in some instances probable cause. That the odor was there, the, the detritus was there, the items of smoking were there, and it would often lead to searches. It's the absence of that, uh, after the wisdom of the legislature in changing the law, has resulted in, as you see, a very drastic decrease. Search outcomes are uh, also closing in on one another and achieving parity in the same way as warnings were. And this too is, as I said, the, the, the term of search rate, uh, or excuse me, search outcome or hit rate is considered in the literature the, the quote unquote gold standard. And uh, the fact that you can identify bias uh, by these things. If you are searching lots and lots of white drivers and coming up with nothing, then maybe you have a bias towards searching white drivers. Um, what we see here is that those rates are closing in on one another. And this is the total data, it's just the, the, the sort of overall numbers of this sheet. Um, let's see. Sorry. And so I open it up for questions, and I, I know that we're closing in on time, so. Yeah, I guess maybe, I, can I just ask if, are people willing to stick around like five minutes after nine just to keep going a little bit? Are people unwilling? Anybody unwilling just, yeah. pardon? They can get up and leave. Then they no, can get up. Just, just, just a few <coughs> minutes, just so we can keep going, because I'd love to give some time for, the, for uh, Officer Murad to take questions. Um, start at the back and find a, phone, find a microphone. Hi, uh, thanks, it sounds like good news. I just have a question. The last time um, this analysis was done, uh, I know Professor Seguino at UVM came out with kind of a very different analysis and I'm just wondering if um, you've heard from her or if, she's, uh, if you know if she's looking at it and um, whether or not she begs to differ with some of the, the results that, that you guys have. have I have not heard from the professor. Uh, I don't know whether she's looking at it or not. We went, we, we audited our own uh, data. There's, this PowerPoint is a much abbreviated version of a longer report that is available on our website uh, and publicly accessible. Um, it is, uh, it's very, I, I feel that it's very clear. Certainly the chief put a lot of time and effort into it uh, and I think that it is, uh, uh, it's a true picture of how uh, enforcement and dis how enforcement has changed and how disparities have been reduced during his tenure. Well, it, it certainly sounds. It certainly looks like like good news. And it, you know, having followed this for a number of years, it looks like the BPDs come come a long ways from 
say 10 years ago or so. So thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, real quick, um, I'm going to reveal a little of my na uh, naivete. I haven't owned a car in eight years now, but how much can you attribute the technology advancements um, that have shown up in, or that I believe have shown up in cars related to uh, crashes with injury? Crashes and everything. Crashes it, it, with it, injury, it, I'm it, sure, yeah. have been affected by things like uh, airbags, by the ubiquity of different kinds of crumple zones, the fact that that, uh, that cars are safer. They have also been significantly affected by the fact that the city went from 30 to 25, and they have been significantly affected by the fact that a number of roadways have gone back to being one lane each direction roadways, sometimes with turning areas, but nevertheless, that slows traffic. Um, and and it is a, uh, it's, it's an important factor in, in how you keep drivers safe. I was more talking about like the, the cameras that stop cars, you know, uh, automatically as opposed to I drivers. don't believe, the, so automation hasn't affected driving at all yet in a statistical kind of way. So, you know, proximity alerts for vehicles when something gets near, um, whether or not those are in fact minimizing accidents that your, uh, you know, your, your rear, your side view mirror blinks when you get too close to something, or the car itself tells you by sound or by sometimes voice that uh, that you're closing in on something. Uh, there is no data to determine that yet, but those technologies are really in their infancy and they are not penetrative towards the market as a whole. So I, I wouldn't expect a lot of change from those yet. We live in a state, remember, that just passed laws to make certain that certain cars no longer have to be uh, inspected in the same ways for registration, uh, owing to the fact that they can't pass registration because they are old and can't make it through certain kinds of smog conditions. Um, and that is an, an, an acknowledgement of the cost burden on members of our community who drive cars that are wildly old, and those do not have sound proximity meters. Um, let's let somebody else in. If it's short, I'll just repeat it into this. Uh, so as a, as a motorist, Excuse I, me. Thank you. As a motorist, I, I appreciate the, the gentle approach to enforcement uh, that the department seems to be taking. But, but as a pedestrian and a cyclist, I often don't feel safe on our streets. I see a lot of aggressive driving, a lot of kind of uh, rapid acceleration, uh, uh, disrespect for crosswalks. And, and I'd like to see an, an effort on the department's part to address traffic issues from the perspective of pedestrians and, and, and cyclists because I think it's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different world out, out there. It's, uh, it's, it's not safe on our streets because people don't uh, respect those rules. They think they can turn right on red whether you're in the crosswalk or not, et, et, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Same issue is, um, is there any uh, concerted effort to deal with the cell phone and electronic usage while driving by police force in the city? Because again, oh. as a pedestrian or bicyclist, uh, that creates a danger for us much more than it does for other drivers. Sure. So I don't know the percentage of, of those 444 tickets or of those 2,700 something stops that were uh, cell phone or handheld device um, related, uh, but we do make stops for them. So uh, if that's if, that, if that's observed, officers will will make stops for it. So I wanted to first uh, echo some of the previous comments saying that uh, looking at these graphs that uh, yeah, I think uh, police department is doing a much better job and the data is pretty promising. So thanks for being here and showing that. Uh, my uh, question is um, in regarding the data, I, I did not see any uh, statistics on 
when there is a traffic stop, if there uh, is a is, if there is a violence or or an altercation occurs between the motorist and the police officer, and how that relates to race, um, having that kind of uh, data, as we we've, we've seen in the news over the past few years, and I'm not, I'm not saying Burlington uh, Police Department is is worse or any, any better or anything like that. I'm just saying that's a very important statistic to have in order to show that uh, it is true that the um, Burlington Police is really being more equitable. I think that would really help uh, to show to the community that it is really true. So having uh, at a traffic stop whether uh, violence occurred between um, the police officer and the motorist and uh, what the race, ethnicity was of the motorist and the police officer is very crucial to have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to speak for my neighbor, Jared Wood, <laughs> um, who walks every single day. You might talk to him also. I have. But I totally agree with what he says. And he suggests that if it is not worth your while to give out speeding tickets, that you should double the fine and collect more money. Because you are not, I mean, I see these charts and you're saying enforcement is done. That means you are not enforcing or you're not seeing the problems. That means that we are see we're not seeing the problem as often. It means that we are uh, seeing there are there's a different threshold for officers to make those stops, frankly, and some of that is driven by a uh, you know there are there are two. There are two uh, bell ends here of, of people who want more enforcement because as Jared uh, talks about, there is uh, a sense that people are vulnerable as pedestrians and as bicyclists, uh, although I also get plenty of complaints about bicyclists, plenty. Um, and uh, there is also a sense that traffic stops are at their heart. Uh, inequitable even when the directions of racial disparity are going in the right uh, direction, the right trend as is shown in these charts, that it is still a an encounter that is problematic and fraught and that uh, certainly if they turn into a revenue generator, then you end up with either perverse incentives from officers, you end up with uh, a sense of, of whether or not people can afford these tickets. Again, I go back to the example of the legislature deciding that in spite of this state's clear commitment to uh, a belief that climate change is, is uh, anthropocentric and is caused by man and is real, that we are getting rid of certain kinds of, uh, of standards for emissions because we are concerned about members of our community who can't afford to uh, rectify the emissions or, or to meet those standards. That goes into arguments about traffic stops as well. And officers get this, they hear this, and do they change their threshold for stops? Yes. I would like to, I would like a world where the behavior is the only thing that drives the decision. And if you have behavior of a stop that is behavior, driving behavior that requires uh, enforcement because it is dangerous, it is either going through stop signs, it is weaving, it is, uh, you know, accelerating, uh, going too fast on roads that we've changed the speed for, that that would occasion enforcement activity. And that enforcement wouldn't have to be a ticket issued, it could be a warning as 80% of these are. Um, but that's not the message the officers are getting from the people of this city. And I can tell them until I'm blue in the face that I disagree, but they have, uh, they have heard a different message. And that changes the way in which they react. Now they're going to do things, uh, they are still going to act when they see egregious safety violations in driving. Somebody going 70 miles an hour uh, east on Main Street to get out of town at bar closing is getting stopped if there is a police vehicle in that vicinity. Somebody who is, is reported by other drivers, we respond to those jobs and find people who have been reported by other drivers. There's somebody driving erratically southbound on North Avenue, I just pulled on to uh, the belt but he's continuing south. Officers respond and attempt to find those vehicles, we do. But is the threshold for officers to decide whether or not they pull over a car on their own volition as they observe violations that may not be so distinct and, and clearly 
uh, clearly dangerous towards safety? Has that changed? I believe that it has. I believe if this community wants that, the community has to speak with a more singular voice about what it wants. The officers are not hearing that. They're hearing that we don't want that kind of enforcement. I think that anybody that gets a traffic ticket won't speed again, like to me. That, and I, that I, I must disagree with you, ma'am. A traffic really? ticket changes behavior for a very brief period of time. And the people who conduct themselves in that manner while driving change their behavior for a short period and then they go back to driving the way they were. Now that is not to say that enforcement doesn't make a difference. And if you are a completely reckless driver whose recklessness is curtailed for some period of time, that is some period of time in which that recklessness is not putting our neighbors in danger. That's valuable. But it does not change their behavior in any real long-term way, which is why traffic calming measures Overall laws that do, in fact, cause everyone else to slow down and necessarily then cause even the speeders among us to slow down most of the time when they are caught in traffic have greater impact. Well, I have had four relatives killed by drivers. That is, and I, I that is horrible. It's unbelievable that you think you should not enforce because it's going to be traumatic to somebody. I didn't say that I think that we should not enforce because it's traumatic. Who wanted to speak next? I have a question about. Uh, what we can do as a pedestrian or cyclist or each, actually even when I'm driving if I see someone who's I think is like speeding I, I'm on Colchester Avenue quite mm -hmm. a bit would it make a difference if I could take a photo of their license plate and send it in would you accumulate those would you no, not no I, I make a difference as civilians here. Calling in a behavior that you are witnessing is effective and officers will respond. Taking a photograph of something that you allege occurred and sending it to the police is not. It, it's not, there, there's no, that is not a complaint that we will follow. I have no evidence that anything has occurred beyond your word and I am not impugning your word but in an anonymous sense having it come in and say here's the license plate of a car I saw going very fast. That is not going to occasion uh, a uh, much. Now, our data is cumulative, and our knowledge of individuals is cumulative. And to the extent that knowledge of a person's uh, alleged behavior adds in is, is helpful, that could have an impact. But it's, that's not going to, I'm not entirely certain how we'd even record that data absent making an incident for it, and that's not worthy of an incident, to have somebody call in and say, here's a picture of a car I saw going too fast. Here, it, uh, calling, especially, and not, not you, unless you have a hands-free device and are actually capable of calling from the vehicle, but a person in your car or being able to stop safely and make that call that I witnessed this, this was the location, that is going to be recorded and, and officers will be dispatched to that. By the time they get there, the speeder's wig on, or the yes. tailgater's wig on. Yes. But not always. Sometimes there's an officer close by enough to actually turn right onto the, the street. Yeah, and and, and the, 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 you know, the thing about speeding in Vermont is that speeding in Vermont never gets you anywhere. You can pass somebody who is frustrating you tremendously in Essex on Route 15, and by the time you get to St. Mike's, that person is right behind you anyway. So the, uh, the, the notion of it is, is faulty, but it doesn't change certain people's need to do it. But it does impact whether or not that officer is going to be able to find that person. Is that a 911 call or a general? Uh, 911 will take it. Dispatch will take it if you have the direct line for dispatch in Burlington as well. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Jason Stelfon. I live on Colchester Ave and you know, walk, bike, drive around. And uh, the one thing I notice, I see a lot of patrols by car and a lot of patrols by foot. But for the first time in 19 years, I actually saw a police officer on a bike. And I feel like you need much more of that out there because if people don't know whether someone on a bike is a police officer or a regular person, you know, they'll get accustomed to seeing you in that same place of life. And so people are all doing all three of those transports, but there's only enforcement by two. Sure. Um, so kind of secondary to that, if we're really going to move forward as a city with all this new bike infrastructure and really increase the bikes, we need some sort of enforcement because I see all sorts of bikes at nighttime with no lights on. And I'm driving a vehicle, and I almost hit them because I can't see them. Yes. And, you know, and so I personally, I'm trying to be as safe as possible, but they make it hard for me, and I don't ever see any enforcement of that, or maybe it happens, I don't know. But I feel like there needs to be something for the egregious um, bike, you know, 
behavior that's out there because I feel like every single pedestrian's bikes, cars, there's egregious behavior, but I haven't seen it enforced on bikes, you know. And then if you're saying about the reporting, when I go across a crosswalk and a car cl almost clips me at 40 miles an hour, it's scary, but nothing ever happens unless someone gets hit. And so I know when I bike, I have cameras on my bike and I've had stuff happen to me and I report it and they're like, yeah, there's nothing we can really do. So I actually have video footage of that would absolutely cars change. and everything. I mean, it happens to me all the time and it seems to be, I'm told that there's nothing to do about that. And I have many friends that bike around. I would like to know if I, we have footage, video footage front and rear of something happening to us, where do we send that? How do we, you know, get something done about that? Because most of the time, by the time something happens, it's too late and gone. You're fearing for your own life. You're not trying to take down license plates and everything else. If Thank you me. report such incidents to the police and say that you have video footage, they will come and get that footage, or, or you can send it to the police. That would go into a case. That would That's different than a photograph of a license plate saying this car was going fast. That's evidence of an act. And we we do enforce uh, some of those laws. We don't, I mean, uh, the lights, uh, we, we do more education. We try to do education on these issues. We, we've done some education about um, about the rules about cycling, linked to the FAQ that the city has up to that, put it on our social media posts. We have uh, talked about bicycle safety with kids in the schools. The officer that you saw is a school resource officer. He works a bike in the summers and goes to the parks. Those bikes were obtained by Chief Del Pozo, um, free of charge from uh, Budnets, I believe. and. Uh, uh, it was uh, a really great innovation. We, we, it takes a week or more, sometimes it depends on the training program, but up to two weeks to train an officer to be a bike police officer. It's not just riding. And finding that amount of training time has been a challenge. And we are not in a position right now to have done it. So Officer Hemond, Corporal Hemond, is, is still certified for it and is able to use it. I too think it's a great uh, method. With regard to enforcing against bikes, um, you know, with regard to being on the marketplace where you can grab a bike and a bicyclist, yes, that happens and is enforced. With regard to following a bike on a street in a vehicle, we're not going to do that. It's dangerous for both parties. And the idea of, of being able to chase a bike that can rapidly change direction and move in different ways up and down streets that you cannot, uh, it puts more people in danger than it's worth to try to say, what have you done, even if you... Now, that changes if, if a bicyclist has just collided with a person and that person is injured uh, and then and officers are there. Officers will pursue that uh, as long as it remains safe for them. But this person doesn't have a light that is visible from 500 feet from the front at night and is going southbound on North Avenue and I'm going northbound, I'm not going to pull a 180 and screech my lights on and chase them down North Avenue. So so those kinds of, those are the balances of enforcement. And I don't mean, to, I'm not trying to be facetious or, or, or show extreme examples. I'm just saying that that there are, you know, somewhere within those poles exists the some enforcement, but it's not a wide amount uh, between those poles. Just a quick follow-up, I would just say, I, I, I feel like if you can get a couple more officers on bikes and even just do warnings by enforcement, just to, you know, on a bike, you could see the person sure. coming the wrong way on the bike lane and just be, hey. A bike officer would be more you. able to yeah. pursue another bike than a vehicle, but 100%. Yeah, yeah, I feel like warnings, you know, that would serve a good purpose too, just to let people know what they're doing wrong. Thank, Thank you. And then I think we uh, give the entire so, um, Deputy Chief uh, Murad referred to some documentation that I sent him, and it really was documentation. Every, everything I sent you is minuted, yes, sir. or I have the emails for. Uh, and so, I'd still like your comments on that, but not necessarily in this forum. But the one thing that comes out of so many stats in this city is stats that seem to um, reinforce uh, a, a particular agenda uh, and we could talk about um, uh, complaints about quality of life going down in particular areas where the, the, the neighborhood is saturated with uh, students. No one's going to complain because they're all partying. Uh, you're not going to see people stopping at stop uh, going through stop signs or red lights if you don't have anyone looking at it. So I don't understand uh, why it's valid to put up stats t that you are doing. And I appreciate all the good stuff that you do. 
but if if you're not enforcing or if you don't have a mindset to enforce or have people out there then you're not going to know what happens and that is infuriating and the we know the, the crash has become the I proxy for that you, sir uh, and the officer uh, on East Avenue that I referred to in a particular thing two or three years ago he said the residents are right that's just about exactly what he said the residents are right I ran a sharp patrol and I collected seventeen hundred dollars worth of tickets yes, sir. on East Avenue in five hours. And he recommended that the traffic, the traffic calming uh, measures be installed. And nothing happened. We don't control traffic calming methods, sir. And and uh, the but, but, and Department of Public Works but, indicates the, that the, they are both in the queue. Both the Mansfield residents. Ave and East Ave are in the queue. The, the, so the residents have to stitch together between the various city departments to get people to address a glaring problem. That's not satisfactory to residents. I don't want to um, go on about it, but it's just not satisfactory. I don't believe they have to stitch together multiple departments. I think they go to the department in question. They go to Department of Public Works to say, this is, this is what we need. Which is where we started. So it's a circle jerk in that particular case. Well, I don't care for the term, but I think that it is uh, a sense, uh, it's a matter of saying that we went, you have to go to the agency that has control over that. I don't have the ability to create traffic calming measures. That's not what the police department does. Oh, I know. That's what I, that's, I guess that's what I'm saying. We, I, the resident but I you are in the queue. They have, this, they have that project in their queue. They received it in 2017, and they are... There's a gap between doing anything, be between enforcement, uh, between identifying a problem and getting anything done about it, and, and there's no enforcement to fill that gap, and that is, I, I perceive that is a problem, and I perceive that that's what happened on North Avenue when the gentleman got killed. I, that I, had I nothing to do with enforcement that. since the uh, driver was going under the speed limit. It was an instance at dusk, and that was and that was specifically a location where they're where they're, they're tr trying to put in a crosswalk now. But that had nothing to do with enforcement, so enforcement wouldn't have changed that. You're angry that the. But you said enforcement needs to fill in the gap between when a request is put forward to DPW and when that request can be affected. And what I'm telling you is that the enforcement is not the means of filling in that gap. So I, I think we got to move on, um, and maybe, and maybe this is where our elected officials can also be part of the conversation. I don't know whether you want to continue this one, but where, where there's, uh, where there's a police department and a DPW, and something has to get done, maybe we need to talk to our elected officials about it, um, and that may help. Jack, you got as much time as you want until everybody leaves. All right. Well, so I, thank I, you for your patience. Yeah. Thanks everyone who's who's come out tonight. This is the biggest crowd I've seen here, and really great discussion. And thanks for all the people who came in to present. Thank you, um, everybody. I'll will keep it quick because it's nine ten, but um, and then I'll just take questions um, after every council meeting. I post uh, an update of what happened at that meeting. Uh, I post it on Front Porch Forum. I have a website and and on social media too. So hopefully, folks are able to to see that um, and. It went out. It usually goes out on Tuesday or Wednesday after the meeting. So I'm looking at it right now. It's in today's front porch forum, and I can just refer to that. So it was a pretty non-controversial meeting on Monday. Um, a lot of unanimous items that passed. Um, there was a new appointment of a new city attorney, assistant city attorney. Um, there was an update from the superintendent, Obang. Uh, we updated an ordinance for building permit fees. We updated a regulation of garbage, trash, abandoned vehicles, appliances, and furniture on private property. Um, we passed a resolution asking uh, Department of uh, Parks and Rec to uh, report on expanding their tree planting program. Um, and we passed a resolution to move plans forward to redesign the roundabout on Shelburne, um, Shelburne Street. Um, the, kind of the beginning of Shelburne Road, um, that horrible intersection with the, I, I hope people know what I'm talking about. Um, there's a really bad intersection that is finally going to be redesigned with a proper roundabout. Um, so all of those things happened. And another thing that I wish we would have 
spent more time on in the council meeting. We It was the first item and we really rushed through it, which I think was really a shame, but, and the mayor mentioned it tonight, but also didn't, didn't have time to cover it or didn't cover it, but the Burlington Electric Department has just released this 50-page uh, roadmap for getting Burlington off of fossil fuels by 2030. Uh, it's probably the most ambitious roadmap of a municipality in the country, or, or one of one of the most for sure. Um, it, it lays out a number of strategies from a high level that would get us there. And I think this is really critical and, and something that I want to continue the conversation on. And it, it's something that it, it's definitely not going to happen unless we have policy measures. And what, unfortunately, the, the report, it didn't list a huge number of policy measures. It was pretty high level. It more talked about the strategies and what it would take to get us there. So it talked about building electrification, um, weatherization of buildings. It talked about the need for uh, electric vehicle infrastructure and conversion over to electric vehicles. It talked about increasing alternative transportation. Um, so it kind of hit on what would need to happen but it didn't dive deeply into the suite of policies that would be necessary to get us there. Um, so, but that, that's our job um, as city councilors and as residents is to, to really work towards those policies. Um, and that's what, what I'm doing. And for the next city council meeting, I plan to, to put forward a resolution that would require all the city departments to take meaningful action on climate change and incorporate it into their processes. Because if, if the city's not taking the lead and the city's not moving off of fossil fuels, we can't, we shouldn't expect um, anyone else to. So I think this is something that's really gonna take everyone participating and, and getting involved, but I, I do think it was a really impressive document and, and to lay out those goals and that foundation is, is really critical. Um, so, I'll leave it there and just open it up to questions or thoughts. Hi, Jack. Um, this is something I would have asked Moreau, but didn't have a chance to. And I know we've talked about it, just the development agreement around City Place. Yeah. Um, and I know Perry has tried to put forth a resolution among city council members, and that has not gotten supported. Um, it's just my, sen my sense that we're not using that agreement the way we could. Um, and I don't know where you stand with that or if that's your perception or I'm hoping city council members are, are willing to have this conversation now that we're farther down the road. Yeah, yeah, I think we should. So there was a resolution that I supported um, that would require more accountability from Brookfield in terms of updating the council and updating the public. Um, and that got referred to the CDNR committee, Community Development Revitaliz Neighborhood Revitalization Committee. Um, so they'll be looking at that at their next meeting and then it'll come back to the full council. Um, but in the meantime, um, the progressive members of the city council, we've, we've set up a meeting with the mayor to talk about w what is the extent of accountability that we can use that we can leverage now that the development agreement is has been violated um i think personally i think we should go to the fullest extent that we can um in terms of whether it be f i would imagine fines would be the most blunt instrument but whatever whatever instruments we have legally whatever recourse we have for them violating that agreement i want to take it to the fullest extent that's not shared by the number of other counselors, and I don't, I'm not sure, you know, I haven't heard the mayor say that, so I'm not sure if, if he would agree with that. So I don't know if there's enough of us necessarily on the council to, to pass something like that or to make that happen, but that's where I stand. I want to, I want to take it to the full extent. This is a multi, you know, Moreau, the mayor said $300 billion company. I don't know if that was accurate, but it's a huge company. It's a massive global company, and I, I think they only care about money, is my perspective. A company that big, they only get that big if because they're only focusing on profits, and 
I don't think they're gonna, if we start hitting them with fines, I don't think they're gonna say, oh, we're mad at Burlington, we're gonna punish them. I think they're gonna say, oh, we're losing more money. Let's do something more quickly so we don't lose more money. I think it's all about money for them, and so I don't think we should be afraid of them punishing us or anything like that. I think we should use the accountability that we created with that agreement, whatever that is. So right now I'm just working to understand what are we able to do, and then I'm going to push for it. But I don't know if, you know, it's not just up to me. So I don't know if that'll happen, but that's what I'm going to advocate for. So Jack, you, you'll post the results of that conversation between the caucus and the mayor? Um, wh yeah, I what mean. You, <laughs> what, what, you, um, what you can? Yeah, I'm not going to, you know, record it, but I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll post the, the general, I mean, I'll post what I'm going to push for coming out of that, and if, if I gain any more information on what we can do, that's the biggest thing I want to understand and push for. Yeah. I, I, I think I'm in a position where I didn't, I, I didn't support this project from the beginning, so I don't really have any reason to try to pretend that things are going well. I don't have anything to hide. So I'm just, yeah, I'm going to be all out with that. Okay. Other, other questions? I would like Angie. to say, yes. <laughs> I would like to say, um, again, Jack, uh, and publicly in front of everybody, that I really appreciate that you take the time to give us news every time there's a city council meeting. Because otherwise, if I don't go to the meeting, how else would I know that? And so, um, at least this constituent sees it and reads it every time and appreciates it. Thank you. Thanks. That's great to hear. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Anybody want to talk about anything else before we adjourn? <laughs> Hearing none, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank your patience. Thank you, Jonathan.